our time together, we just pray that you would guide us as we um, consider what in many respects is a difficult psalm. And thank you that you are a God of justice, that you are a God who intends to set all things right. And we pray that you'd encourage us in that truth as we consider the psalm together tonight. Help us to really see that um, as we pray psalms like this, really what we're praying is for your will to be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. And help us to be moved and motivated to pray exactly that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In, uh, in early 2015, a singer-songwriter by the name of Rachel Platten burst onto the international music scene with a song titled Fight Song. Now that song quickly became an inspiration to music listeners everywhere. It's one of those songs that, you know, if that song is, is played as a backing track or if it's going to be sung at Britain's Got Talent or America's Got Talent or something, it's going to have one of those, those inspirational videos that go along with it about, you know, some struggle that this person went through and they're fighting and they, they overcame it. When asked what inspired her in writing the song, Rachel Platten said, quote, Fight Song was inspired by a lot of experiences that were hurting me and that were making me feel like maybe I didn't have a chance in this industry. I wrote it because I needed to remind myself that I believed in myself. No matter what, I was still going to make music, even if it was on a small scale, even if it was just for me. Well, Christians can sometimes relate somewhat to what Rachel Platten must have been going through at that stage. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed by opposition and by adversity, and we feel like we're just not going to make it. David certainly knew what it was like to feel that way. And like Rachel Platten, when David felt that way, he responded in song. He responded by writing songs, by writing psalms very often. But unlike Rachel Platten, when David wrote psalms that he needed to remind himself about he didn't write songs to remind himself to believe in himself. His fight songs were about the Lord fighting on his behalf. And really that's what Psalm 35 is about. Psalm 35 is a prayer of David for the Lord to fight on his behalf. The body of the psalm can be divided into three major sections, which we will read as we make our way through the psalm. Um, but David first sets the scene. He takes the first three verses to sort of set the scene. And then from verse 4 down through the end of the psalm, he divides it into these three major sections and three petitions to the Lord to fight for him. He says in verse four to, verses 4 to 10, he asks the Lord to protect him. In verses 11 to 18, he asks the Lord to acquit him. And then in verses 19 to 28, he asks the Lord to vindicate him. But before we get to those three sections, let's look at David setting the scene, first of all, in verses 1 to 3. So David writes in Psalm 35 verse 1, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of a shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. And in those three verses, you see David introducing each of these three sections that he's going to expand later. So he begins by saying, Contend, O Lord. That word contend, as we'll see in a moment, is a, is a legal word. And he's asking the Lord to stand up for him in a court of law, as it were, and to acquit him against those who would accuse him. He says in the second part of verse 35, he says, Fight against those who fight against me. And he speaks of taking the shield and the buckler and drawing the spear and the javelin. And those are all military terms. And he's asking the Lord there to rise in a military sense and fight for him to protect him. And then he says in the last part of verse 3, Say to my soul, I am your salvation. And really what he's asking the Lord there to do is that as these enemies rise against him, whether it's in a military sense, or whether it's in legal sense, he's asking the Lord to vindicate him. Come along and say, I am your salvation. And show, we'll see when we get to that section, that he asks the, or asks the Lord to vindicate him against his enemy. So those are the three major sections of the psalm, and David introduces it here in the first three verses. But as we go through the psalm, the one thing you'll notice is that this is what we call one of the imprecatory psalms. Now, imprecatory psalms are psalms in which the psalmist prays for God to come in judgment against his enemies. 
And these psalms are often difficult for us to reconcile as New Testament Christians. Because we're so accustomed to what the New Testament tells us to do in terms of loving our enemies and praying for our enemies and doing good to those who hate us. And so as we come to Psalms like this, and frankly this is one of the milder imprecatory Psalms, but as we come to Psalms like this, we find it difficult to reconcile how could the psalmist write these things and how am I supposed to use this for prayer? And really that's my burden tonight. This is a 28 verse psalm. We cannot go into any great length in in detailing what David is writing here. I hope to give you a, a brief overview. But really what we're trying to encourage people every week is that we have a prayer psalm of the week. Use the psalm to to build your prayers throughout this week. And maybe as we're going through this psalm, you're thinking, how on earth can I pray things like this? Well, I hope to show you why David could pray things like this, and then I hope to show you at the end how you can actually use this to guide some of your prayers this week. But let's first give an overview of what David is actually writing here. So again, he's got three petitions that he makes to the Lord. This is David's fight song. And he's saying, fight for me, Lord, in three ways. Number one, protect me, verses 4 to 10. Number two, acquit me, verses 11 to 18. And number three, vindicate me, verses 19 to 28. And in each of those sections, David has a prayer, and then he closes at the end with a praise in anticipation of God answering his prayer. So let's have a look at this. In in the the introductory section, David, in verses 1, the second part of verse 1 to the first part of verse 3, David pleaded with the Lord to go to battle on his behalf. He says in verse 1 there, Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. That's all military language. And of course as king of Israel, David would have been very familiar with with military warfare and the need to go to battle. And as king, David would often go to battle on behalf of the citizens who were under him. Now David, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, is asking God to go to battle on his behalf. And so we have this prayer of protection. He's asking God to protect me. So he says in verse 4, yes, he he has David, he's going to, he's, he's already introduced it in verse 1, and now he's going to expand on that. And so he says in verse 4, He has how he wants the Lord to fight against him. Verse 4, Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Why? For without cause they hid their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. Now those are are seemingly harsh words for David to, to pray. When we studied Psalm 31 several weeks back, I made the point that the subject of shame, as the Bible speaks about it, is far deeper than we often think about for, for characters in, in the Old Testament and, and, and really in many Eastern natures, the, the idea of shame has weight beyond the grave. That not only did someone in, in that culture not want to be viewed with shame now, but they didn't even want to be remembered with shame after their death. It was a, it was a great, uh, it was a horrible thing to be remembered, to have a legacy of shame after death. And so for David to be praying for the Lord to put his enemies to shame, this is a very, very severe thing. In fact, the Bible makes the point, even in terms of final judgment, that after the final judgment, God's enemies will be remembered for eternity with shame. Well, David's prayer is that his enemies be put to shame. Now, how will these enemies be put to shame? Well, he lists several things. He says, number one, Lord, turn them back. Force them to retreat in the face of the divine warrior. He says, let them be like chaff before the wind, driven away to be seen no more. The idea is you would take the wheat and you would throw it up into the air and the chaff would be blown away and the good stuff, the wheat, would fall back down again. And he's saying, let them, my enemies, be like that wheat, be driven away to be seen and remembered no more. Let their way be dark and slippery. Remove their confidence. Help them to be completely unconfident before me. He says, let the angel of the Lord pursue them. Let them always be on the back foot, running but never advancing. And why did David pray this judgment upon them? Because he says in verse 7, Without cause they hid their net for me, and without cause they dug a pit for my life. Now that phrase, without cause, is going to be very important a little bit later. 
But what David is saying here is that, not that he was completely sinless, but he's recognizing that these enemies that had risen against him were not instruments of God's judgment. As sometimes that might be. So you remember the instance in uh, 2 Samuel um, chapter 24 when David numbered the people of Israel and he did so sinfully. And God said, okay, I'm going to give you three options as a form of chastisement. One of those options is that you might flee before your enemies for three months. And so God is saying there that God would be willing to use David's enemies as an instrument of judgment against him. Yeah, David's saying that's not the case. The enemies that have opposed me, not, this is not by God's divine appointment. They're opposing me without, without cause. They were seeking David's harm when he had done nothing to warrant it. He had searched his own heart to see if there was anything worthy of such treatment, and he came to the conclusion that there was nothing. And so what did David ultimately pray for his enemies, for those who were pursuing him without cause? Well, he prayed for their destruction. In verse 8, let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. He doesn't want just temporary reprieve. He wants these enemies to be completely destroyed. And in verses 9 and 10, he praises God in anticipation of God's protection. So he says in verse 9, Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. So David's not going to be saddened to see his opponents fall. Instead, he's going to rejoice and he's going to exult. But he's not going to rejoice and exult in their fall per se. He's going to rejoice and exult in the Lord. He's going to rejoice and exult in the fact that the Lord loves him and the Lord is willing to step in and deliver him. That the Lord is willing to deliver, he says there, the poor and needy. And so he says in verses 4 to, there, four, 4 to 10 there, Lord, protect me. Rise up as a soldier, as a divine warrior and protect me. Well, then in verses 11 to 18, he develops this theme of this, this legal theme and he says, acquit me in verses 11 to 18. So again... In the beginning of verse 1, David had introduced this when he said, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. And again, that word contend is a legal word. It was used of of a courtroom appearance. And so now David's going to develop this theme of a legal trial in verses 11 to 18. And once again, he prays to God to acquit him, and then he praises God in anticipation of that acquittal. So he says in verse 11, Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother, as one who laments his mother. I bowed in mourning. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. David speaks here of malicious witnesses. Again, a legal term. That these witnesses who rise up against him, ask him things of which I do not know. In other words, they're, they're fabricating accusations against him that he actually can't answer. Because he's not expecting it. Where are these accusations coming from? They're coming out of thin air because these malicious witnesses are simply inventing them. The word malicious, by the way, speaks of an intent to kill. So what, 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 what is happening here is that this, this damaging false testimony is arising, as it were, in a case that involves the death penalty. They're bringing this accusation against David in order to destroy him. Now, by the way, the same tactics have been used throughout history by enemies of the gospel. Potiphar's wife brought such an accusation against Joseph in the hope that Joseph would be destroyed. The satraps in Daniel chapter 6 brought such an accusation against Daniel in order to have Daniel landed in the lion's den. The ultimate example, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, who did nothing wrong, and yet his enemies brought all sorts of false accusations against him, which he could not answer. He, he, He could not answer them because they were complete fabrications. That's how the enemies of the gospel often operate. Well, in contrast to the way that his enemies had treated him, David had treated them well. He says, they repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. And by the way, if you read the Old Testament, that's a verifiable claim. 
Saul was an enemy of David. When David had opportunity to kill Saul twice, he didn't do it. There's a story in 1 Samuel 25 of, of a man named Nabal. And David's on the run. One of the many times he's on the run. And he comes to Nabal and he says to Nabal, Look, we've been yeah, amongst your shepherds, me and the, the men that I'm with. We've been amongst your shepherds. And we didn't mistreat them. We didn't, we didn't attack them or take anything unwarranted. And so we've been kind to your shepherds. So give us some food that we need. And Nabal says, Who's David? I'm not going to give you anything. And he he treated David poorly in response to the good that David did for him. But what was this good that David did? He says that when I was sick, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed down on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother as one who laments his mother. I bowed in mourning. When his enemies were afflicted, David afflicted himself and prayed for their deliverance. And that prayer was not a prayer, a, a show of false piety. But it was a deep, heartfelt prayer for the good of those who opposed him. In contrast, verses 15 and 16, they, at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. And not gathered to have a party, because he says immediately, how did they gather? They gathered together against me, to do me harm. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. Every time in the Bible you see gnashing of teeth, it's always a picture of of anger and hatred. And so what these enemies are doing is that they're, they're gnashing their teeth at David and they're gathering together. They're trying to destroy David. They're taking the smallest opportunity that they have when David is down and they're trying to destroy him completely. Again, we cannot but, but note the parallel to the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, the religious leaders, they first tried to kill him themselves. And they even, they even co-opted military help for that in the garden when they arrested him. When that failed, what did they do? They resorted to a kangaroo court. They went the legal route. Because the military route had failed, so let's go the legal route and try to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's what David is experiencing here. And so he prays to God for acquittal. And then he praises God in anticipation of that acquittal in verses 17 and 18. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. David knew God's character well enough to knew that God would not just stand by while his enemies were mistreating him. He says, how long, O Lord, will you look on? In other words, act. Do something now, Lord. Rescue me from their destruction. Again, they're they're rising against him in a legal battle. And David's saying, I've got a greater advocate than you have. You may have these malicious witnesses, but I have one who is able to defend me. And so he prays to the Lord to do that. He says, I will thank you in the congregation. He, he believes that God will actually answer his prayer and deliver him. And so he, he commits that he will thank God in the congregation and that he will, in the mighty throng, praise the Lord. And so we see David's prayer in verses 4 to 10 to protect him. We see his prayer in verses 11 to 18 to acquit him. And then in verses 19 to 28, we see a prayer of David for vindication. He says to the Lord, vindicate me. In this final section... He develops what he said in verse, the the last part of verse 3 there. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. In other words, rather than abandoning me to my enemies, vindicate me in their sight by delivering them. Let, Let all my enemies, all those who are gathered against me and are gnashing their teeth against me, let them see that in fact you are my salvation. That in fact you will deliver me. Vindicate me in their sight. And once again, he prays for vindication in verses 19 to 26 and then he praises in anticipation of vindication in verses 27 and 28. So first we have this prayer for vindication in verses 19 to 26. It says in verse 19, Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes and let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause. For they do not seek peace but against those who are quiet in the land they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. You have seen, O Lord, 
Be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness. And let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our hearts desire. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. Ultimately, whether they were trying to do so by military force or by law, David prays that his enemies would not be allowed to overcome him. Once again, he acknowledges that they were his enemies wrongfully, that they were opposing him without cause, that he hadn't done anything to deserve this. This wasn't an act of God's chastening against him. These were enemies who were rising against him wrongfully. He says that, in in fact, in, in these verses you see that they were not only opposing David, but in fact by opposing David they were opposing God. Because, for example, he says, they do not speak peace. They were opposed to peace. And those who are opposed to peace are opposed to God. Because God is the God of peace. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And so if you're opposed to peace, you are opposed to the God of the Bible. He says that they're against those, in, those who are quiet in the land. They're devising words of deceit against them. Not only were they opposed to David and opposed to peace, but they were actually opposed to all of those who, like David, were interested in honoring the Lord. These are enemies of God's people, largely speaking. They're also opposed to truth, because it says in verse 21, they open their mouths wide against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. We just saw that they were malicious witnesses who were, who were fabricating testimony against David. But now they're claiming this testimony that we're fabricating, we're actually our witnesses. We've seen you being guilty of these things, David, of which David actually wasn't guilty. They were lying blatantly. They were opposed to the truth. And again, those who are opposed to truth are opposed to God. Because God is a God of truth. But in contrast to the lies that his enemies claim to have seen, they're saying, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. But David says, verse 22, you, O Lord, you have seen. You actually know the truth. And you will not be silent. You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. Speak up vindicate me. Do not be far from me. He asked God to awake and rouse himself for David's vindication. Not that God had fallen asleep. The Bible tells us very clearly that the God of the Bible does not sleep. But when you read of God rousing himself, of God awakening, when you read of God standing, it's always an an act of vindication that he's about to act on behalf of his people. He says in verse 24, Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness. Not according to my righteousness. Not because I'm such a great person. Not because I deserve kind treatment from you. But because you're a righteous God. And you do not, you are not honored when malicious witnesses rise against your people. You are not honored when lies are told in order to destroy innocent people. And so according to your righteousness, vindicate me. He says, let them not say in their hearts, verse 25, aha, our heart's desire. Let them not say we have swallowed him. Don't, Lord, don't let them have their way. Don't let them rejoice that they have destroyed me when that is what they intended to do. Instead, again in verse 26, David returns to the theme, let them be put to shame. Let them be disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. Once again, in an honor-shame culture, that was a a very severe prayer to pray. That's what David is praying. And then in, in anticipation of this vindication in verses 27 and 28, he praises God. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. He fully anticipated that the Lord would hear him and that the Lord would answer him, that the Lord would vindicate him. And in fact, not only him, but all who delight in righteousness would experience this vindication from these enemies, and all would have cause to praise the Lord. 
His ultimate motivation is not actually personal comfort. His ultimate motivation is, I want reason to praise the Lord. And I know if you vindicate me, I know if you deliver me, that will give me reason to praise you. And not just praise you very quickly, as is so often the case with us, but I will praise you all the day long. I will have cause to for long-standing praise as you deliver me. Well, so much for the content of the psalm. Words like this in this psalm, and again, this is perhaps one of the milder imprecatory psalms. As we read these words, often we wonder, how could, how could someone pray words like this and they be contained in Scripture for us? Because perhaps you're, perhaps you're following the Bible reading program set out in the bulletin or something like that. And one day you read Psalm 35 and you're thinking, Wow, these are strong words that David is praying. And then perhaps a few days later, your reading is in the epistles, and you read words like this from Romans chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is good and honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And we, we're familiar with words like that. And so we read these imprecatory psalms and we think... What is there for me in these imprecatory psalms? How could God put words like this in the Bible? And how on earth am I supposed to use this as a template for my own prayers this week? Well, let me just say that there's, there's, there's number one, there's a wrong way to think about this. Okay, the wrong way to think about this, number one, would be saying, well, David was just vindictive and out for revenge. Some people approach the imprecatory psalms like that and they say, well, you know, actually there's nothing for us to learn there. Um, it was just David on a bad day and he prayed this prayer and really the only thing we should learn from it is not to pray like that. The problem with that is, well, there are several problems. Number one, David was not a bitter and vindictive man. If you read, the, you read the Bible, you read the Old Testament, you realize very quickly that he was not a vindictive man. Again, he had two opportunities to kill Saul. And both times he said, I'm not going to do that. And in fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, when he receives word that Saul had been killed, he's grieved. And he mourns and he says, let's not publish this. Don't, don't tell the enemies of Israel about this. He's deeply grieved that the king of Israel had fallen. In the psalm itself, David never asks to take vengeance himself on his enemies. But he prays for God to act, which by the way is exactly what Romans chapter 12 exhorts us to. But of course we want to remember ultimately that this psalm was written under inspiration. This is the Spirit of God inspiring David to write the psalm. And so we cannot say that there's nothing for us to learn here. We also don't want to respond, as some have done, by saying, well, this is the Old Testament. And we know that the Old Testament is full of wrath and judgment, but the New Testament is full of love and grace. That's simply not true. These words, for example, are found in the Old Testament. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And those, by the way, are some of the most quoted old verses in the Old Testament. Verses like this, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. We just read those words in the book of Romans. What you may not know is that Paul was actually quoting the Old Testament when he wrote those words. He's quoting from Proverbs chapter 25 verse 21. You've got the story of Jonah, where God says, I'm going to judge this entire city. But they, they repent, and God forgives them. On the other hand, consider words like this in the New Testament. These are, the words of, these are the words of John the Baptist concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus speaks of his enemies and says that they will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Some of the, the last words in the New Testament, towards the end of the New Testament, are these. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our Lord. Why? For His judgments are true and just. For He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged her blood and avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. It's simply not true that the Old Testament pits a God of wrath against the New Testament's God of, of grace. And so we cannot respond to Psalm 35 in that way. So how should we think about this? Well, first of all, let's talk about how we should think very quickly about David actually writing the psalm. Number one, We should note that the enemies against whom David prayed were ultimately God's enemies, not his own. David's not praying for personal. This isn't someone that's just irritated him a little bit. These are enemies of God, and their enmity toward David is simply a a symptom of that. But also, these are enemies who are hurting other people, not only David. And again, as king of Israel, David is responsible to shepherd these people under him. And so he's praying against those who would cause harm to other people. And of course, I think we can assume that David acted as a king should. And he he did what he needed to do as a king to stop this, but he's committing the same situation to the Lord. David, of course, was also a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And very specifically in the psalm, I said to you that those those little words without cause are important. Because Jesus, in fact, in John chapter 15, speaking about himself, he quoted the psalm. In John chapter 15, he said, Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. And the Lord Jesus Christ is saying when David wrote that, he was writing it prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's it's quite clear that because David is not praying for personal vengeance, and because he's not praying only against enemies who were affecting him, but also enemies who were affecting his people, and because he's a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, this psalm fits in perfectly well. But still, and yeah, we need to bring this to a close, still perhaps you're thinking, fine, So you're telling me that David was right to pray this way. But you're also saying that I shouldn't be using the psalm, and I am saying this by the way, I shouldn't be using the psalm um, to to guide my prayers for my personal vendettas. Maybe you're irritated with someone who did something in your church. This is not the, the time to pray that God would bring them to utter destruction. Okay, that's not what that's not what we should be taking from this tonight. So how must I use the psalm to guide my prayers this week? I'm not a king. I'm not a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. How on earth can I use this psalm to guide my prayers? Well, I'm glad that you asked. First of all, again, and just very briefly, don't pray this, don't pray like this in terms of your personal vendettas. Please don't. Okay? That's not what the psalm is telling you to do. But really, prayers like this are just one expression of the prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ told us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You must ask, is it God's will for wickedness to abound on earth? Is it God's will for truth and peace to be opposed on earth? If not, then if we're praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying for peace to conquer and for truth to conquer and for liars and those who hate peace to be put under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. During the during World War II, Dietrich Bonhoeffer prayed this prayer against the Nazi reg- regime. Quote, God, now step in and destroy your enemy. Use your power. Let your righteous wrath blaze forth. Because these were enemies who were opposing peace and truth. And it wasn't a personal vendetta that Bonhoeffer was praying. He was praying that God would bring this evil regime to an end. Quite some time earlier in the late 1890s, Charles Spurgeon was a a pastor in in, um, London while 
Jack the Ripper was active in London. And on one, one Sunday morning, Spurgeon prayed this prayer. We hear startling news of abounding sin in this great city. O oh God, put an end to this and grant that we may hear no more of such deeds. Let thy gospel permeate the city and let not monsters in human shape escape thee. It is right to pray for God to bring an end to those things that oppose him. It is right for us to pray for God to bring an end to crime. It is right for us to pray for God to bring an end to false religion. Particularly to false religions that openly persecute God's people. We should be praying for the downfall of those false religions. When there are missionaries who are, who are being persecuted and Christians who are being persecuted in, in highly Islamic cultures, we should be praying for God to bring an end to that. We can pray for God to bring an end to godless governments. If we're praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, then surely, surely we must pray against those things that are being done on earth that are opposed to his will in heaven. And yet at the same time in all of this, Let's be happy for God to put an end to wickedness in whatever form he sees fit. Because you see, ultimately, God has two ways. One of two ways of dealing with wickedness. Either he punishes the sinner or he punishes the Savior on behalf of the sinner. The Bible tells us that God is a consuming fire and that he will ultimately destroy all those who oppose him. But he's also patient and willing to forgive those who repent of their wickedness. But that forgiveness is not just a broad sweeping of sin under the rug. God forgives sinners based on something that the Lord Jesus Christ did. Based on the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross on behalf of the sinners whom he would save. And the table before us testifies to that very truth. On the cross, Jesus Christ bore the punishment for the sins of those whom he would save. He died on a Roman cross. And his elements down at the table remind us that his body was broken and his blood was shed. Not because of anything he did, but because of what we did. And again, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, will one day destroy his enemies. There's coming a day when he will put all his enemies under his feet. But right now, he holds out the offer of forgiveness to those who will receive it. The elements represent what the Lord Jesus Christ did to save sinners. And so, as we go to the table in a moment, if you're a sinner who has trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, then you're invited to partake with us in remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for you. But perhaps you're still sitting here. You're sitting here as one whose heart opposes God. As one whose heart opposes God's truth, who opposes God's peace. Well, if that's the case, then these elements are not for you. Rather allow these elements to pass you by. If you are one who is opposed to the truth of God, this table is not something for you to remember, but really it's something for you to fear. Because the Bible tells us that those who partake of these elements in an unworthy manner drink judgment upon themselves. Those who will repent, and all of those who will repent, have the promise of sweet fellowship with God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But those who resist... And those who resist God's truth until death, resist God's gospel until death, have only the fearful promise of eternal fire. And so we're going to go to the table now. But let me just reiterate that. If you're not a believer, if you're sitting here and you haven't bowed in your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance, and you haven't asked Him to forgive you of your sins, then do not partake tonight. Do not partake in an unworthy manner and drink judgment upon yourself. But if you are a believer, a believer who has been baptized upon profession of faith and is a member of a local church, then join us as we partake together. Let's pray and then we'll go to the table. Father, we do thank you for your truth and the truth of the gospel tonight. We thank you that you are a God who is holy, a God who ultimately intends to punish sin, to punish sinners. Thank you that we can pray to you for vindication, that when we are opposed for the sake of truth, when we are wrongfully opposed, we don't have to seek vengeance ourselves, but that we can indeed pray for you to vindicate us. We can pray for you to
to fight on our behalf. We pray that you'd help us to remember that even this week as we use this psalm as a template for our prayers. Help us n- never to do it in a way that, that prays according to our personal vendettas. But help us to pray as those who, who genuinely want to see your kingdom come. To see your will done on earth as it is in heaven. But realizing that in order for that to happen, wickedness and sinfulness and everything that opposes you needs to be brought under your feet. So help us to pray accordingly for your glory and honor. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if I can ask the men who are going to join me.